Welcome and good evening, everyone. I let me know if you can hear me. I know we had some uh, volume problems last week. My mm. name is Nicole Carpenter. I am the Director of Programs and Education here at the Westport Museum for History and Culture. Before we start this evening, I want to thank everyone who has supported us in the past. Your uh, contributions are what makes these free programs um, available to our entire audience. If you are able to support the museum, we do have a donate button on both of our websites at westporthistory.org and also on virtualhistorywestport.org. Uh, again, we thank you for anything that you can give at this time, whether it's a kind word or a suggested donation of $5, anything that you can do at this time is greatly appreciated. Also, if you want to follow us on social media, please follow us on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. You can always see uh, our newest posts and you will also get notifications from Facebook for our live events if you do like our page. So please go over and give us a quick like if you are enjoying our programming. So tonight we are doing one of our Tuesday treasures. It's our weekly highlight from the collection of items that you might not have seen before. So tonight we are doing what we have uh, we've cleverly called under the skirt. We are going to look at some of the undergarments, um, both under the skirt, but also under the bodice or the blouse um, of costumes uh, that you've seen probably from our textile collection. Uh, last week, we actually looked at reproduction versus real costumes. So some of those gowns that you saw last week, if you haven't seen the video, go back and uh, take a look maybe after our presentation tonight. Uh, these are the garments that would have been worn underneath dresses like that, um, or bodices. Uh, these are the foundation garments that help create the silhouette that we've seen in the past. So I'm going to move you a little bit closer to some of our items tonight. Don't mind, or don't, uh, I hope you don't mind that I won't be on camera until I come back at the end uh, to answer any questions. And again, if you have questions throughout the program, um, please put them in the comment bar. I'm going to go through the comments and questions at the end and try and answer um, any that I can. So let's move a little closer. We're going to start this evening on this end. I'm going to pop my gloves on so I can hold up our items for you. Tonight we're going through uh, pieces that would have been um, very popular or at least would have been seen around 1900. Um, some of our pieces are a little bit earlier, some are a little bit later, but for the most part we are focusing on fashion um, around 1900. It's also important to note that we are focusing on fashion um, in the, uh, the West. Um, both in the United States and in Europe. We won't be looking at any um, uh, fashions of um, any Eastern um, uh, cultures this evening. That would be wonderful. And we do have some pieces from um, some other places in the world. So that might be something we look at later. The first piece that I thought we would look at tonight is actually this piece here. So this is a chemise. It is white cotton. It does have, if you see up at here at the top, it does have a lace insert. This is just a, a white lace insert. Um, this does have some detailing up at the top you may have seen before. Uh, and this is from roughly about 1900. This is very, very common to see on um, this kind of white cotton um, undergarment like this. And this was actually the very first piece that a woman would have been putting on in the morning. This is uh, worn against the skin. And this actually, um, again, if you think about laundry practices, this is probably the most, um, uh, the highest quantity of clothing in a woman's um, wardrobe would be chemises because they would be laundered before a dress would. Um, this is worn against the skin to kind of protect the nicer gown and bodices um, from being uh, ruined by uh, sweat or dirt or anything like that. So this is something that's going to be laundered um, much more frequently and that are owned 
in a much higher quantity. The next piece uh, that would have been worn with the shoe or would have been put on at the same time as the chemise were the stockings. This is a pair of stockings from our collection. These are blue. They are cotton. And they do have a bit of embroidery on them here. I hope you can see these little pink kind of clover motifs on there. They're really quite nice. And they are on the, um, the front of the stocking. They do not continue um, very far up the leg. They go just, just above the ankle here. So it would have gone chemise and stockings. Then, interestingly enough, a woman from about 1900 probably would have put on her shoes. Uh, she would have done this because just after the shoes comes probably the most difficult part of getting ready in the morning, which is putting on her corset. So this evening we have several different corsets to show you. Let me shift you over just a bit. So the first corset we're going to take a look at is this piece here on the mannequin. This is an underbust long line corset. Underbust just means that the top of the corset actually starts just under the bust line. Um, an overbust would have those kind of uh, sweetheart neckline that would go just above. Let me lift you up a little bit higher. There we are. Long line simply means that the very front of the corset and also the hips extends past the hip bones. So the hips would start here, but the corset actually uh, continues on. And it is not um, boned all the way down. So you can see this part here is fairly um, flexible. Um, we are going to go into corsetry a little bit more um, towards the end of my discussion this evening, because there's a lot to get into with corsets. Another piece that I have tonight is actually on the table here. Let me push you down just a little. And it's this corset here. This is made of white cotton. It is a, a bit thicker of a white cotton rather than the chemise that's very, very thin. Um, this is a wraparound corset. So you can see it actually has a slit over here in the side where one of these kind of um, straps is pulled through. And that's what would tighten. This is for the other side. And then they would be tied around the back. This is um, a soft corset, meaning it doesn't have any boning. It does provide structure to the, um, the bust area. It actually adds support because of the way that it's constructed, but there is no boning or metal or any kind of um, structure in that way. The next piece, this piece in the back is very, very delicate. Um, I am going to lift it just a tad so you can see it a bit more. This is actually a silk, um, a silk ribbon corset. This is made of ecru silk or satin. Um, and I wanted to show you this piece in particular because, again, it is an underbust corset, meaning it is worn um, just under the bust. Um, I'm going to tilt you up a little bit. It would have been worn um, from about here and it would have extended just above the hips. So it's not a long line corset. It does have these ribbons on the side, or, sorry, in the front and but in the back. So it's very flexible. It does have some boning on the sides, but only in these panels here. And there are five uh, panels for the boning or excuse me, there are six panels for the boning. Um, the reason I wanted to show you this was one, because it's very different from the other corsets that you see um, both on the mannequin and on the table tonight, but it also gives a really wonderful picture. And I don't know if you can see it very well. Um, the closure here in the front has actually 
um, molded to fit the shape of the bust of the woman who had been wearing it. Um, a corset to be broken in was meant to be worn for uh, a couple of hours at a time, very, very slowly, laced very, very loosely so that it could actually have time to heat up and actually mold to the wearer's body. It was not something that was meant to be worn extremely tight, especially when first put on so that it could mold. Even these side panels, um, again, I don't know how well you can see, but even these side panels are actually bent uh, to, to follow the shape of that woman's body, which is really fantastic. After the corset, so after either the long line or something like this, this ribbon corset, then would have come the drawers. Uh, drawers are... We don't have any in our collection. They are a bit tricky. Um, they're almost like pants um, without a middle. Uh, they're very tricky to explain, <laughs> I apologize. Um, maybe I will post a picture um, down in the comments below after our discussion this evening. Uh, drawers were worn either over or under the chemise. I found examples of both. Um, Drawers were basically to uh, preserve a woman's modesty, but still allowing her to have layers on her legs. It also made it easy for her to use the restroom. Um, over top of the drawers would have come a variety of pieces, depending on the time. Since we're in uh, the 1900s, it would have been uh, petticoats. And actually, to show you this next piece, I have to back you up. Again, in 1900, it would have been petticoats. Um, but we do have a piece in our collection that I thought was just too fabulous not to show you. Excuse me one moment. In the 1850s, very, very late 1850s as well you might have seen something like this. So this is one of two um, cage crinolines that is in the museum's collection. So you can see this is the back here with this kind of basting tape. Um, it creates a uh, long, long line for the dress to kind of drip over. Now, again, this is something that we would not have seen in the year 1900. Uh, this had fallen out of favor by the later 1860s. Um, so this is something you would have seen ladies wearing during the Civil War era. We think of those large kind of bell-shaped dresses. This is something that would have been used to achieve that. Um, whether you used a cage crinoline like this or not, you would have been wearing petticoats. Usually at least one petticoat underneath the cage crinoline, again, to protect your legs from this. Um, these hoops could be made of um, wire or metal. Our hoops are made of metal. So there's one petticoat underneath the crinoline to protect your legs, and then there were usually at least one or two up to three layers of petticoats over top of this cage just to add even more volume. It's also a matter of warmth. Um, again, a, a large skirt like this is very far from the legs and it would be very, very helpful to have all of these layers of petticoats so that you can stay warm. That's also another uh, upside of wearing drawers is that the ladies' legs would be warm because they are a tighter fitting piece of uh, our garment. So the other thing that I wanted to show you before I put our crinoline away, it is also a full floor length. So it probably, after here, it goes for another uh, probably foot and a half. So it is a full crinoline um, almost to your ankle. Um, it also has, just here in the front, you can see it also has uh, loops for a lacing that could bring the cage in 
um, for a more fitted silhouette or could be let out for a fuller silhouette. So let me move her over to the side again. It also has an adjustable strap over here on the side to allow for different waist measurements, which we're going to get to a bit later. So after our and our stockings, our petticoat, our corset, our shoes, then we will come to a very important piece of clothing that we don't see anymore today. And I don't think a lot of people recognize as a piece of kind of Victorian wear. Just it's not the most um, well-known piece. So over top of the would be either combinations. Combinations are uh, literally a combination of a pair of drawers and of a corset cover. And I have a couple of examples here. There's one here. This looks very, very similar to that white chemise that we looked at, but this only covers um, the actual corset. So it has sleeves here. This also has a lace insert, but this has a, a kind of blue um, decorative lace. The other reason that this would be more highly decorated than a chemise was that the edging of this might show. Um, this was a decorative piece. It helped create um, the Victorian um, pigeon bust. Again, the, the, the corset of the time was to create an S, an S shape like that. And the, the bust was meant to look almost like a pigeon, very, very round, rather than kind of um, tapering like we want today. It was considered very fashionable for your bust to be round like this. And the corset cover helped to achieve that. Um, so it was partly a silhouette changing garment. And it was also partly decorative because it could show above your bodice. Um, it does have buttons here in the middle as well, and it does have a string on the back to adjust the waist very, very minutely. We have another uh, we have another example of a soft corset here. Um, this very, very similarly to both our chemise and our corset cover, it has a lace insert here, or sorry, a ribbon insert and lacing. And it has some very slight boning at the front here. You can see the channels for the five um, pieces of boning. This also has some ties at the back to help adjust, but this is a very, very slight modification. It would not be um, extremely tight. The other corset cover that I have tonight is unusual because of its color. Most corset covers that uh, we have in our collection and that I've seen in other collections um, are that white color, that cotton. This is also cotton, but it is a black corset cover. Again, it has lacing at the top, which is a brown lace. It follows that same kind of silhouette, but this also has um, that ribbon insert but it is unusual to find it in this, this color. Um, I was really surprised when I found this in our collection. It's really quite, um, quite beautiful. The, the rarity of a colored um, undergarment like this would have to do with um, your status. A white chemise, Decorated in this way would have been cheaper than a dyed fabric. Again, it's more labor intensive. There's more material um, to create something with color, especially as it's not something that is worn on as the outermost layer. Again, this is what is directly over your corset and then over top of um, your corset cover would be your bodice. So this is not a garment that was meant to be worn um, alone that was meant to be um, viewed by everyone 
Again, an edge might show through, but this was not the garment that was going to show. So it's unusual to find it um, in colors, especially black. Those are all of the pieces that I wanted to show you tonight. Um, oh, I did forget. There is one other um, foundational piece that a Victorian lady would be wearing. And unfortunately, we don't have one in our collection. I would love to have one. Um, but a Victorian lady would have been wearing a, a bum pad or a bustle pad. Um, this is a piece of padding that would have been worn um, at, the, at the lower back, over top of the petticoats, and it would have been a uh, almost a, um, a half circle of padding that would have had ties that tied around the front. And it was purely to add a little bit of volume um, to, to the, posterior, the posterior. Um, so that is the very last foundational garment that a uh, Victorian lady, a lady around 1900, um, would have been wearing to create a full silhouette. Um, there are instances of women wearing um, bust pads as well. Um, again, that's not something that we hold in our collection, um, but it is not uncommon, but it's more, uh, it's not as common as um, uh, some of our other foundational garments that we've looked at tonight. So next I wanted to, just before I get into questions, um, I wanted to get into uh, corsetry a little bit more. It's something that I have been reading about and doing more research in lately. Um, it's sparked my interest as a historian. Um, so I wanted to just discuss a corset like this um, and this silk corset, that the ribbon corset that we looked at just before, uh, a little bit more before we delve into our comments and questions. So specifically, I wanted to get into some of the myths that are surrounding corsets and corsetry. So the first myth I wanted to address was this idea of tight lacing, of lacing a corset so that both sides actually meet. Um, I am going to rotate our corset over here on the side, this one here. Um, the idea of wearing a corset fully, fully closed um, so that both sides are touching and perhaps overlapping. That's the idea of tight lacing a corset. Um, there is a misconception that that is how a corset was worn by Victorian ladies. And I'm here to tell you that is not how they did it. Um, most women, when they wore a corset like this, would leave somewhere between an inch or more between their lacing. So what you see down here at the bottom where it is fairly open is very, very common for uh, actual lacing techniques of a corset. We also have this, uh, this, this picture, all of these characters of Victorian ladies having their maid um, pull, pull them shut into their corsets. And you can actually see the way that our um, corset is laced here that it has um, loops. These loops are actually to allow a woman to corset herself. So she does not need the help of anyone else. Um, she can fully lace and, un excuse me, she can tighten and untighten her laces completely by herself simply by lacing uh, the corset in this way. Um, so you, if you ever see a corset that is fully laced and it does not have these loops, these loops would have either been tucked in, tied off. They might have been wrapped around the waist before being tied off. Um, if you do not see those loops, it is probably not a true um, historic lacing of that garment. So keep that in mind when you see um, corsets in your, in your travels. There is um, this idea of a, a very tiny, tiny waist for Victorians as well. Um, I've heard people tell me that 
uh, Victorians laced down to an 18 inch waist, uh, that they could put their hands around their waist and something like that. And that is really horrifying. Um, and I'm here to tell you that that is not um, an accurate depiction of corsetry in, um, in history. Uh, there are a couple of things that let us know that this is not a true um, depiction of historic garments. The first being actual historic garments themselves. Um, in the museum's collection, we have somewhere around, I believe, a dozen corsets, um, both soft and um, hard corsets, such as this, fully boned corsets. Uh, the median measurement of the waist, the smallest part of our corsets, is 26 inches. Uh, a 26 inch waist today is considered a size medium. Uh, again, and that depends on which brand of women's clothing you're looking at. But again, just looking at the museum's collection, um, our from our donations, at least our median or average um, is a 26 inch waist. Um, there are other collections. There's actually uh, the Fashion Institute in Bath or the Fashion Museum um, in Bath. They found with over a thousand corsets, they found their average measurement to be about 24, which is a size small. But again, there are corsets on the higher end of that as well. The other thing to know about historic garments is where they come from and why they exist. Uh, all of these pieces are in very, very good condition. Um, besides this silk piece, because of the material, the silk has degraded. Uh, these pieces come down to us through the years because they are um, either not used very much or they were owned by a family or an individual of a higher status. Um, working clothes don't typically uh, survive the ages. A young woman's clothes is much more common to find in a collection because she grows out of them, um, she doesn't hand them on. Uh, wedding dresses are in collections very often because they are a special garment uh, that maybe is worn once, maybe passed on, maybe worn two or three times, but it exists because it is not um, worn out the way that other functional garments are. Pieces like our corsets also exist and survive because they are taken well care of. Uh, a corset like this might have been um, fairly expensive, but it's also a foundational garment that a woman is wearing um, every day that is custom made for her. Um, it is extremely important that a Victorian corset fit exactly perfectly. Um, and it's actually, again, as I mentioned, molded to her body by wearing it in a certain way over a certain uh, amount of time. So that it actually, um, once it heats up, it will actually uh, mold to her shape rather than her being molded to its shape. Um, now, again, there are examples of women um, tight lacing that usually comes from an upper class woman or a very formal event, um, a coming out event in court, um, things like that. But most of the historical pieces that exist um, today that are still in good condition that can be measured. You usually find waist to be somewhere between 24 and 27 inches, which is a perfectly fine measurement even for modern women. Um, another thing to know about some of the myths of the Victorian era um, where we get these uh, misconceptions about corsetry are fashion plates and photographs. Uh, fashion plates very often are drawings of women wearing a, a style of clothing that can very easily be manipulated. It's very easy to draw a woman with a tiny waist and it is idealized. Think of the same way that our magazines and um, other advertisements are idealized for a very specific size of woman. Again, our society, we know that that is not the typical um, size of a woman. A lot of people would say idealized. A lot of people would say uh, unrealistic. Um, but those fashion plates were the kind of models of their day. So they were a very idealized woman. 
um, meant to be something to be strived for, but not necessarily achieved. Photographs of the time also pose a little bit of a problem because we think of uh, altering an image as a modern kind of uh, thing to do with media. But it was possible with Victorian photo photography as well. Again, photos could be retouched um, either with the film or the actual photograph. Um, the other thing that ladies were very clever to do to accentuate a very small waist, they would use things like that bustle pad or a bust pad to create uh, volume elsewhere to make the waist look smaller. Uh, we have these images of women with very, very large sleeves and many, many petticoats that ex exaggerate her shoulders and her hips, and it makes her waist look much, much smaller. So do keep that in mind when you're looking at um, photographs. The other thing that lets us know um, that tight lacing on corsetry was not something that was happening, um, at least it was, it was not deforming people the way that we hear of in many sources is skeletons of Victorian ladies. Um, of course, there are always skeletons that have um, uh, growths and shapes that are out of the norm, uh, but a majority, the overwhelming majority of Victorian skeletons are perfectly fine. Um, there are not uh, deformed ribs or uh, busts or anything like that. Um, it's also important to note that not only women were wearing corsets, men were wearing corsets as well, uh, not to create an hourglass uh, silhouette for the most part. There are examples of men wearing um, this style of corset, but most of the men's corsets were actually to create a, uh, a smaller tummy. Uh, some would call it a, a beer belly today. Uh, it was meant to, to smooth the stomach and bring the hips in just a bit to create more of an athletic build. Um, and these male skeletons from the, uh, the turn of the century um, are not deformed either. So it, it's interesting to see the garments versus the skeletons. And then the last thing that we kind of uh, see as a source for these myths are writings. Um, I will tell you that there are no verified accounts of a, a lady fainting from being in a corset. Um, we get those accounts from uh, fictionalized works. Uh, we also don't find any um, verified accounts of a woman or man ever having their ribs removed. Again, in the Victorian era, surgery is an extremely um, risky proposition. The idea of going into a surgery to have your ribs removed to make a corset fit better is something that is not verified um, by the historical record um, in any way. Um, do keep that in mind as well. Um, and there's also, again, there's these literary accounts of, of women fainting or um, being breathless, and that is, is not substantiated either. Uh, it is good to know that being in a corset does shift organs. Uh, it's been supported that organs are shifted slightly, but as soon as the corset is removed, they settle back into place. Um, much like a woman going through pregnancy, it's been found to be very similar. Um, it is not considered detrimental to their health. Um, so I hope that was helpful. The other thing that I did want to tell you um, our corset covers are also a very good indication of waist size for ladies at the time. The median corset cover size that we have at the, the museum, and we have um, actually, um, I believe we have about 30 examples of a corset cover. The median measurement for those is about 28 inches. Um, so again, understanding that the corset cover is just over top of the corset um, and trying to create a more billowy silhouette, uh, it makes sense that our corset measurement average is about 26 and our corset cover is about 28. Uh, so it, it fully supports this idea of, of women having a, a about 
a uh, 24 to 27 inch waist um, that's supported by the historic garments that we have here. So I am more than happy to answer any questions that you all have. Um, I do see that we have some comments and if you are at all interested in um, some more of our research, again, there are quite a few uh, books that are written on this subject. Um, I'm happy to share some resources with you. Um, always happy to, to answer uh, any questions that you have later on if you find any sources that you would like me to look at. So let me come a little bit closer so that I can look over our questions here. So I have a question from Cheryl and she asks, were the stockings always blue? So these are, these are uh, original stockings of the time. They were blue. Um, again, it would have started as a white fabric, again, just like the um, corset cover. Let me bring you a bit closer again um, to see these stockings. Um, these would have started off white and they would have been dyed this blue shade. Um, the same thing with the embroidery floss, it would have been white and then dyed pink before being sewn into the garment itself. Um, and again, it is unusual to see uh, blue stockings. Most stockings of the time are uh, white or an ivory, uh, a natural color. Um, think of linen, things like that. Um, so it's unusual to see a, uh, a colored version like that. Um, again, not unheard of not something completely out of the norm. We also have some examples um, in the museum's collection of um, red stockings. Um, it's also good to note that garments that are dyed are not all, are not all the same indication of class. Uh, a natural fiber is always going to be cheaper than a dyed version, um, but a natural dye will cost less. Something that is dyed yellow is much cheaper to dye versus something like blue um, that is going to take a couple of different materials to dye at that color. Um, again, I am not a dye expert. There are actual uh, dye experts. Um, but uh, again, just keep in mind that something that's dyed uh, a color does not always mean that it's upper class is just an indication that they might be upper class because it will cost a little bit more to have it dyed, depending on the color. If you see something dyed purple, they're definitely upper class. That's a very, very, very uh, difficult dye to create and would be very expensive. Let's see, we do have some other comments. Uh, Pamela says, hello, hello, Pamela. Uh, she writes, I saw an old drawing of a woman from the 1860s who tripped and this type of garnet got caught on a pole. Oh, goodness. Oh, in the cage. And she also uh, says some of these undergarments and dresses were extremely flammable. Yes, that is very true. Um, there is a uh, misconception that uh, um, women's dresses have always been very flammable. When dresses were made primarily of wool, they were very safe. Uh, wool is flame retardant, so it's actually very, very safe to wear uh, wool garments near, near a fire. But during the Victorian period, during this time period, um, dresses were made of cotton, of silk, um, and the cage crinolines with pushing these dresses out to these huge proportions, um, there are cases of women catching fire and actually um, it being a fatal case um, because of these extremely flammable materials and materials such as the crinoline making it easier to um, be in a fire maybe without you knowing it. Um, so it is a, a downside of wearing these, these cage crinolines. Um, Pamela also asks, would the upper, oh, I, I'm sorry. Um, yes, to, to Pamela, I'm, I apologize. Um, would the upper classes have more garments um, and layers than the lower classes? Yes, yes. Um, 
clothing during the Victorian period, again, the period that we're looking at, um, 1900, clothing is, for the most part, made for you. You're not going to a store and picking out a dress off the rack. You're going to a dressmaker who you're picking fabric out and they're making a dress for you, uh, at least for the upper classes. An upper class woman would go to their dressmaker, pick out the garment, uh, the fabric, excuse me, um, and the dress would be made to her. But she's also buying um, corsets that are completely made for her, uh, stockings, shoes, petticoats. Um, she can also afford nicer materials and she can afford to replace them more often. Um, a lower class woman is usually making her own clothing. So again, a cheaper material, again, going to a, a, a market and buying fabric that may or may not be dyed. If not, she may be dyeing it herself. Um, again, a lot of natural um, flowers and materials can be made into a dye. Um, and then she's making the dress probably on her own or she's going to a seamstress of a lower quality Again, clothing is expensive at the time. It is very, very true that the lower classes would have had less uh, amounts of clothing and also uh, lower quality and just less layers. Um, a lower class lady might also not have been wearing a corset such as this. She may have been wearing stays, um, which is a little bit more of a, um, I apologize, I, let me know if you all can still see me. I think my camera might be having a bit of a problem. Um, I will go through these last couple of questions quickly just in case you can't see me. If you are, fantastic. Um, so again, the short answer to your question, Pamela, is yes, the upper class would have had more garments and more layers. Sarah also comments, some photograph negatives were definitely doctored. Yes, that is very, very true. We have um, some examples in our collection of women who definitely had their, um, who definitely had their photographs doctored. Uh, Sarah also comments on the blue stockings that perhaps they were for a, a, a formal event or a fancy dress party, as she calls it. Uh, and yes, a, a colored piece like those stockings might have been commissioned for a formal event. Um, again, it's probably also for a higher class lady who would have been attending um, events such as that. And Sarah does have a question here and she says, were foundation garments different for different activities? For some ladies, they were. Uh, for a lower class lady, she most likely had a pair of stays, which are a more um, flexible, not as um, uh, rigid and restrictive as the corset we see here. Um, I've actually worn a pair of stays. Uh, I wore stays for a summer and I was teaching uh, colonial dancing outside. Um, and I will tell you stays are extremely comfortable. Uh, they are very breathable. Um, I actually highly recommend them if you ever have an opportunity to wear some stays or to get some stays. Uh, so a lower class lady might have been wearing stays. They were a little bit more inexpensive. Uh, they allowed her to do activities a little bit easier. She may have had a, a corset such as this um, for more formal occasions um, and things like that. Uh, but she probably saved those for those formal occasions and wore her stays on the everyday um, or for everyday. An upper class lady most likely had an everyday pair of, uh, or, or an everyday um, set of a corset. Uh, Again, this is not something that she's wearing um, completely tight. It was probably a bit larger, probably allowed her a bit more movement. Um, these corsets are restrictive in that you can't um, bend over and you can't be doing um, a lot of um, uh, bending, 
but these ladies are wearing fully laced corsets when they're dancing, when they're riding horses, um, at least corsets. Uh, the actual garment that they would be wearing for those occasions are very different. Um, you wouldn't be seen wearing as many layers of uh, petticoats when you're out horseback riding. Um, you would still have drawers. You would absolutely not have a cage crinoline on um, horseback riding. That would be um, uh, very impossible, I think. Um, if you come across any uh, occasions of a woman wearing a cage crinoline while riding a horse, I would love to see it. Um, I think it would be something, uh, something to see. Uh, but for the most part, at least the foundation garments are going to be the same. There might just not be the, um, the same amount of layering, or they might be slightly modified to allow for a specific activity. Um, yeah. I think that's all. I'm glad that you all can see and hear me fine. That's wonderful. Um, I'm glad, and I do see some comments here about uh, someone wanting to try stays and corsets. I, I recommend it. Um, again, they are, uh, both stays and corsets are the predecessors of the, um, the, the bra today. Um, it really was meant to be a support garment. It was not meant to be a restrictive garment um, in the way that we think. It is definitely supposed to be something that uh, was helpful to women and for the most part were designed and created by women. Um, the, the Victorian fashion industry was driven very much by women. Um, the, the first fashion houses that we see aren't necessarily producing under a label like uh, Charles Worth, but they were run by women primarily. There's a Madame Prost, a Madame Potier. There's um, a long list of, of female madams who were creating these uh, women's fashions and corsets, um, as well as the women who actually physically crafted them. The, the, the working class in the fashion industry were also women. Uh, so, of course, if they were designing them, they probably were not creating garments that they believed to be detrimental. So. I hope that this was informative. You all seem to, to have enjoyed it. Um, next week, we are looking at wedding dresses. Uh, so I do hope you will tune back in next week at six o'clock. Um, until then, have a wonderful week. If you have any more questions, please put them down below and I will do my best to answer them. With that, have a great evening. Thank you so much for joining me.